Hey, I'm Grandmaster Igor Smirnov and I'm really excited about the today's video because I'm going to share with you the two techniques that are going to give you an extra 100 rating points right after watching this video, right in 10 minutes. And this is not exaggeration, it's based on my experience of teaching tens of students one-on-one uh, -on -one, as well as thousands of students online who studied my courses and sent me their feedback. So it's real stuff, just stick around for 10 minutes and you will know how to improve your game in no time. All right, so let's uh, look at the chessboard and now let's imagine the situation that you're playing a game and you got into a position where you don't know how to find the right move, let's say in an opening. All right, so these two universal keys are going to help you to solve this for any opening that you play. It's one of the most popular questions you guys send me, like, okay, Igor, you're covering these different openings on your channel, but what if my opponent plays the move that you did not analyze? What do I do then? Let's see it together. So for that purpose, I've chosen, let's start with some opening that I typically don't analyze too much on my channel, let's say the King's Indian Defense, even though it's one of the most played openings of all. And let's even start right here, okay? Imagine you're playing this position as white. Now, how would you pick right moves right here? Now, maybe you know some opening theory about the King's Gambit, but it doesn't really matter for, for this case, because let's imagine that you're trying to find the right move yourself without relying just on you knowing some opening variations. Okay. Now, what do we see here? Well, it's an opening stage. You need to develop your pieces, fight for the center, castle, stuff like that. But how do you find the right move? Because we know that, yeah, if you want to develop pieces, you may develop this knight, you may develop the other knight, you may develop this bishop somewhere, or you may prepare development of your light score bishop somehow. So what do you do? Like, which move is correct? Well, here is the rule. I call the principle of flexibility, which means that you want to leave yourself more options for the future. You want to play the must moves and leave more options for the future to choose from. For example, if we're talking about this position, we quite know for sure that this knight is going to go to c3. It doesn't really make sense to put it to d2 because it would block out the bishop, block out the queen. Doesn't really matter. Doesn't really make sense. Also, it blocks the queen from defending from the defense of this pawn, so black may attack it one way or or the other, and the pawn is no longer defended by your queen. All things together, knight d2 would not make much sense. Therefore, we do know for sure that this knight is need to be placed here. Same thing for the other knight. We do know that it needs to be placed here because there aren't many other good squares to, to choose from. And we aren't sure about the dark square bishop, let's say. Because if you develop it too early, I mean, who knows, but maybe black will decide to, okay, let me play here and now attack this bishop and gain extra tempo, right? Or if, let's say, you develop the bishop on onto f4, okay, black may also think, hmm, he defined the position of his bishop early, let me try to take advantage of that. And black may play something like this, for example, and if you capture, black recaptures, and again, gains an extra tempo attacking your bishop. Because you defined the position of your bishop too early without a significant reason. So let's take it back. Again, the idea is that you play your must moves first of all. So the must move could be, let's say, knight goes here to c3. Black goes bishop g7, now we play knight f3, playing another must move. Let's say black castles, we're still going over the main most played moves of black. Now what do you do here? Okay, at this point we know that we need to continue development and therefore you need to develop either your dark squared bishop or your light squared bishop. We also still know the principle of flexibility. You want to play your must moves and leave the rest for the future, right? So you can postpone that decision. We do know that we need to castle. And for that reason, we definitely need to bring out our light squared bishop. And as for the dark squared bishop, we again can postpone this decision. And there is also another principle which uh, I'd love to bring, bring out here, which is the second technique which we're talking about. It's to avoid creating weaknesses unless it is really needed. What do I mean by that? If you, let's say, play a bishop g5, saying, hey, I need to develop pieces, so let's bring the bishop out. Okay, makes sense. But you're stretching your position a little bit too much, right? You put this bishop uh, further or ahead of your of the rest of your army and therefore your opponent may try to take advantage of that and say oh, hey, okay let me attack it right if you go back you say okay let me attack it let, let me keep chasing this bishop and maybe i'll get the two bishops advantage i'm not saying that this is winning for black but i'm just saying that you give black some additional ideas to consider okay okay going back a couple moves Let's say you, you decide to develop your bishop instead of g5 to f4. Still, you may notice a tiny little nuance, but, it's, but it's, it still matters. This bishop on f4 is the only piece in your position which is not defended by any other piece. Right? So this knight is defended by the pawn, this knight is defended by two pawns, the other pieces of white defend each other along the first rank, and this bishop on f4 is the only one which is not defended. 
It's not critical at the moment, but nevertheless, theoretically, it increases the chances of you blundering something or this bishop being under the attack. Even your opponent may say, okay, if I know that this bishop is here, let me play d6 and block out these diagonals so that the bishop is dull and can't move anywhere. Moreover, in the future, black may decide to prepare, you know, gradually this advancement to pawn e5, and he's gonna get an extra temple attacking your bishop. Therefore, here, both of the techniques, the principle of flexibility, as well as the idea of avoiding creating weaknesses unless it's really necessary, tells you that you shouldn't develop your bishop here. Instead, you need to prepare a casting because that's your must. Now, how do you do that? Well, we need to bring this bishop out. How do you bring your bishop out? Well, you need to bring forward either, either this pawn or this pawn. And so you may play e4 and then develop the bishop somehow, or in this game, why I've chosen to fiancato the bishop, they play pawn g3. Okay, cool. So that's also an option. And then the bishop will come here. Now, pawn d6. Now we can finally bring our bishop here. Black responded with knight to c6. And apparently, black wants to strike in the center with pawn e5. Now, how do you play here? What do you think about this? You may actually think about this for a second. How would you play if you're playing white? A lot of players would start thinking that way. Okay, the knight is over there. What if I attack it? Well, you can, but in that case, black is going to go to e5, potentially attack this pawn. If you take in the center, again, it's still fine, but black will recapture and it kind of complicate matters, right? A little bit complicates your life. So again, we're trying to kind of minimize risks unless there is a good reason to, right? Uh, same thing, a lot of players will think, okay, black wants to grab control over the central squares. Therefore, let me do that myself. Let me occupy the center, because that's one of the most classical chess rules, right? Put your pawns in the center of the board, occupy the center, and everything's going to be good in your life. Okay, let's try that. But then black really strikes in the center, pawn e5, attacks this pawn, and now you may be thinking, hmm, the pawn is under the attack, perhaps I'm going to move it forward and kick the knight off. But all of a sudden, the knight goes forward, instead of retreating back, now you start thinking, hmm, this knight is annoying on d4, it's on my territory, what if we start trading, I take, he takes, and I recapture with the queen, oh, I win a pawn, cool, let's do, let's do that. So we're going over this formation, and so far it looks really good for white, we want a pawn, but all of a sudden here comes the boom, knight takes e4, what's that? Discover attack to your queen, and if queen wants to grab the knight, there is rook e8, and black wins your queen using this pin. And if you get into the situation like that, it's quite annoying because you realize that you are trapped and you start thinking that maybe you didn't know this opening trap or you need to brush up your uh, tactical vision or improve your calculation skills. And it's kind of all true to some extent, but in reality, it's not true <laughs> because you can get away without any of those. What you really need is just to follow the two techniques which we're discussing in this video. In this position, you can actually realize that you should not really play pony four because of the both techniques that we're talking about. First of all, e4 a little bit stretches your position out for no big need. You don't really need this at the moment. You may play this later. And therefore, it kind of weakens a little bit, you know, the the neighbor pawn. And even without e e5 and even without that tactics, black may still play bishop g4, you know, and still try to take aim at this pawn and eliminate the knight and maybe together with the bishop. So all in all, black may still try to cause you some troubles here. That's why I don't need that. And also, there is the principle of flexibility, right? Which tells you that you gotta play your must moves. And the must move is casting. You're gonna castle anyway, right? So why, why not to play this just right now? And again, you can postpone other decisions for the future. And what's really cool about your position is that everything is defended, right? So you can cannot really blunder anything because everything is already defended in advance. Now, black played pawn e5, attacking in the center. Now we start thinking about this. Okay, what, what does black want? Maybe they somehow want to attack you on d4. Currently, it's defended. Should you do something about that or not? Well, if, if there is a good reason, if, the, if there is a good way for you to get away of this danger, then you should, right? And there, there is a good way. We can just push the pawn forward. Pawn e5, attack the knight, kick it off. So that's, that's nice. And why not to do that? Again, it's just practical because we don't know, maybe this attack on d4 is dangerous, maybe not, we need to calculate, but it's easier to just avoid this, right? Because then you certainly don't blunder anything. And there is a good reason, we don't need to play any awkward moves, you just play a good move anyway. So it's practical. Now d5, knight goes here to e7. Okay, what do you do next? We're still imitating like you're playing a game, and of course we're not just analyzing the King's Indian defense, right? This is a universal way of thinking that you can apply for any opening position or any middle game position that you play. Okay, now, what do you need? What do you do next? We need to develop our pieces, right? So we need to develop the dark square bush. Where can it go? If we, if we bring it here, black can attack it, and it actually needs to retreat anyway. That doesn't look good. If we bring the bishop out to e3, 
mm, is that good? Well, black can also attack it, right? With, with their this knight or with that knight, and the bishop will be in danger. It will have to go back. It doesn't look good. Then what do we do? Well, maybe you can play e4 right now. Now it's perfectly comfortable, right? Now the pawn is defended, earth and solid, and you occupy the center indeed. So you just play your moves in the most comfortable way possible. And the game black played knight e8, preparing the standard kingside attack, which is the main plan of black in the king's Indian defense. Okay, what do we do now? We still need to develop our dark square bishop. Bishop g5 is still not good because it's going to be pushed away, but what if we develop it to e3? Well, currently it's, it works really well. There is no, nothing to worry about. The knight can no longer go there because it's attacked by our pawn. The other knight is left behind. It can't jump to g4 anymore. Therefore, there is no danger for a bishop and we can just play this move absolutely comfortably. Cool, let's do that. Black played pawn f5. Okay, now let's think about this move because we do need to obviously keep an eye on our opponent and, and what does he want. Does black want to take here on e4? Well, black can, but in that case we're, we're just going to recapture by our knight and everything's good. So the pawn is already defended, we don't have to worry about that. Our knight will be placed nicely in the middle of the board if this exchange happens. But in addition to that, black may wish to also push their pawn forward. And this may be unpleasant because it's going to attack our bishop, put some pressure on the king side. Yeah, that doesn't look good. Now, what do we do about that? Can we prevent this pawn from being pushed forward? Well, we can play queen d2 also, which is a nice move. We develop our queen, and in addition to that, we provide this additional support for the square, so that if the, if the pawn is pushed, we can just capture it and win it after the exchange. But queen d2, pretty cool. Okay, black plays knight f6, trying to attack this pawn once again. Now it's attacked twice, but it's only defended once by your knight. Therefore, we do need to defend this pawn somehow. Well, of course, you could also consider an exchange there on f5. And that is one of the good options for white. But there is another rule, which is something that we don't discuss really in this video, which is, says to take is a mistake, which is another general you know, guideline about chess, because usually when you make an exchange yourself, you somewhat help your opponent. Because right? now black can, for example, develop their bishop with a tempo, or they can recapture with their pawn, and now this pawn got closer to the center, and black controls all the central squares you know, in the middle of the board. And you kind of did that yourself, right? You help black with this exchange to achieve what black wants. So for that reason, usually it's good to keep up the pressure. Again, that's another universal key. And if you're following me for some time, you really know that I'm a big fan of these kind of uh, principles, which are universal keys that you can apply in any position. Not just a rule, because a rule is something a lot more specific. A rule tells you that you need to place a knight on a weak square. And it's all good, but there are hundreds of those rules. And how do you know which one to apply in a real game? How do you even remember them? You know, that's the problem. That's why I do love those few principles, which are universal keys. You can apply them in whatever opening, whatever position, and you just go and play this. Uh, by the way, just just little news, I'm currently working on the new course, Top 25 Middle Game Concepts, which is going to cover the main concepts, the main principles for the middle game, because that's something that I haven't analyzed before that much in depth. I'm usually in this YouTube channel more focusing on the opening, so I wanted to cover that gap as well. But it's not ready yet, I'm just working on it, just wanted to share it with you, because, uh, you know, as a subscriber, you gotta know the main updates. So here, let's come back to our stuff. Uh, black attack the pawn. If we don't want to exchange, is there a way to defend the pawn? Well, you can do that by jumping your or other knight to g5. Now, we're defending it by the knight, by the bishop as well, by this knight. So currently, the pawn is definitely well protected. Black played pawn h6, and the knight does not want to go back. You're going to lose the pawn, but we can go forward, and generally speaking, bishop is stronger than a knight. Therefore, if we can arrange this kind of an exchange, it's good for us. Now, we're having the two bishops advantage. And in fact, black is already... In a, in a big trouble, probably black is, is already lost, because now you're attacking this pawn, actually, with your battery of the queen and bishop, or having two bishops advantage. This pawn on e6 is annoying, controls some squares in black's position. Your light square bishop is also very active along this diagonal, not only supports your center, but attacks black's queen side as well. And you achieve that by playing simple, logical moves following just two main techniques. Right? That's how Carlson plays his games. That's why he loses games so infrequently. And a lot of grandmasters do the same, of course, as well. Just maybe not as great as Carlson, but overall, uh, they're avoiding risks. Right? They're avoiding creating weaknesses unless it's necessary, and they're leaving options for the future so that they don't have to make decisions which are potentially harmful. And that's how they keep playing simple moves, very risk-free moves, and keep building up their position gradually. Now. Since black needs to defend this pawn somehow, black played pawn g5, 
In addition to that, it creates a threat of pawn to f4, which would you know, potentially win the bishop. Therefore, we need to do something about that. Now, what can we do? Well, in this case, we can actually trade on f5, because not only that eliminates the pawn, but it also opens up this bishop so that it can win the pawn on b7, which white really does. Now, by saying that, to take is a mistake, uh, I'm not saying that you should never uh, commit any exchange. I'm just saying that you shouldn't do that unless you have a reason to, unless there is a certain follow-up, right? Or unless you have no other choices. And in this case, there is a really great follow-up. You can win a pawn and attack the rook. Now the rook comes here, attacking the bishop. The bishop comes back from c6. It potentially can maybe even support the pawn in the future. And yeah, why, why is just having a complete dominance here also the other bishop is ready to capture on a7 and also attack the rook. And actually, the game ended just in a couple moves. Black traded here on a3, white recaptured with a pawn because he wanted to open up the f-file. Black played rook to b6, trying to attack the bishop. But white ignored that and found a nice counter blow, knight to d5, attacking the rook. And if the rook tries to grab the bishop, there is pawn e7, attack of the queen and rook. If queen goes somewhere, we're winning the rook there. And after that, you know, thanks to this pressure, thanks to our knight, we can win over here. And now white is already up a rook, and you know, it's time for black to resign. So we just analyzed, it's actually a blitz game, you know, between two amateur players. But you can see how you can find those effective moves quickly and easily and risk-free, even in a blitz game, because really, the technique is so simple. I hope it was helpful. Give it a like if you enjoyed it. Also, if you love my method, then you may check out my free master class by clicking the link over there where, where I go more in depth about this method and share a couple additional universal principles that you can follow. Have a great rest of the day, keep crushing it, and I'll talk to you soon.